Hello everyone, I hope that you're all doing really well and welcome back to a brand new Draw With Me video. If you're new here, I'm Shannon and I'm a pet portrait and wildlife artist and I specialise in coloured pencils and that's exactly what I'm using to draw this portrait today. So this is Eleanor and she is the fourth portrait in a series of commissions that I've done for my lovely client over in Japan and she is a Yorkshire Terrier. She's got these gorgeous big fluffy ears that are really recognisable and I'm using a few different reference photos to make sure they look the fluffiest they possibly can because I think she'd had a haircut in this picture so yeah using a few different ones to get the ears right. Now this video today is in a slightly different format to usual. I normally just stick my camera on, have a little bit of a chat to you while I'm drawing, but this time I've actually pre-recorded the drawing and I'm doing a voiceover because I asked over on my community tab on YouTube for you to send me some questions and sort of topic ideas for these draw with me videos so that I've got like a little bit more structure, there's a bit more to actually talk about and get into some more like juicy topics and conversations so please also excuse how bunged up and stuffy I sound in this video I've had a bit of a cold this past couple of weeks and I'm on the tail end of it now but I still sound a little bit funny so excuse that but yeah just to give you a quick summary of my drawing tools and equipment all that kind of stuff I use the Faber-Castell polychromos along with some Karen Dash luminance to draw this portrait and I'm drawing it on Archie's hot pressed watercolour paper so without further ado, let's just get into the topics and questions for this video. So the first question is, how do you decide what to draw when it's not for a client? And this is a really good question because before I became a professional pet portrait and wildlife artist and I used to just draw for fun in my spare time, I'd draw whatever I liked, whatever I felt like. The first thing that popped to my head, like it could be anything, it could have been an object, a person, an animal. And because it was just for fun, it really didn't matter what I drew. It was kind of just for practice. Um, but as soon as I started my business, I knew that I needed to be a little bit more intentional with the subjects that I chose to draw. When I first started my business, I was primarily just a commission artist. But I did have plans to eventually, you know, do some wildlife art, put my artwork onto products. I just had no idea how to really approach that at the time. But I thought I'll start building up the collection now and then at least further down the line I've got more to work with in the future. So I picked subjects that I felt like would be popular amongst my audience and potential future customers. So I started out with the subjects that I believed would be the most popular amongst customers. Sort of like the generic British wildlife that you see on products. Hares, squirrels, all that kind of stuff. And I was quite fortunate that I found a really talented local photographer quite early on. I saw him on a local Facebook group for a nature reserve where people posted like wildlife photos. I explained to him that I'm a new sort of aspiring artist in the local area and I'm looking for beautiful references to draw from and he was so kind and helpful he said that I could use any of his photos to do whatever I liked I didn't need to ask him um, and and he directed me over to his Flickr which is like a photo sharing website and said that I could use any of those pictures and any of the ones from his Facebook so pretty much used his photo offering as like a basis for the originals that I created. I had a look through all his pictures and I downloaded the ones that I really liked, the ones that stood out to me the most and I planned to gradually, slowly make my way through these photos. I think sometimes when you see a photo you know straight away whether you want to draw it or not. I can be feeling really uninspired and lost, unsure what to do. I could stumble upon a photo that I fall in love with and I instantly get that sort of drive and spark to want to draw again. So that's a really good tip. If you're struggling deciding what to draw next, you want to start building up some originals, have a look at some photos. You might find something that you really like because that's one of the most important things when you're going to be spending hours and hours on a drawing. You want to make sure that you're really passionate about the subject and the photo that you're drawing. Otherwise, you're going to end up getting bored. You're not going to want to finish it. While it's important that it needs to be popular amongst your audience, your customers, 
it also needs to like speak to your heart and be something that you're really passionate and interested in. Sometimes I'll sit for hours on end scrolling through images until I find that one that just jumps out to me. And this doesn't just have to be photographers that you've come across. You can also have a look at free stock websites such as Pexels, Unsplash, Pixabay. I have done a lot of references from there as well. I use them for a lot of Patreon tutorials. But they also have some like really beautiful photos. It just means that there's a higher chance that another artist has probably also used that photo for a piece of artwork. The more time that's gone on and the longer I've had this business, obviously the larger my collection of wildlife has grown. So it's a little bit easier now to see gaps in my collection and see what's missing. And because I do a lot of craft fairs and and because I do a lot of craft fairs and share my work on social media, I do get a lot of suggestions for things that I could draw. And if I'm seeing the same suggestion popping up like over and over again, I know there's probably a good reason to go and have a look at some references and try and get that subject in my portfolio. Sometimes I'm also just inspired by things that I see in my day-to-day -day life. I could go for a walk and see a certain type of animal and think, oh, I really want to draw that now. Or I could see something on a documentary or I could see something on Instagram that another artist has done or something that a photographer's posted that will just inspire me to want to draw a certain subject. Sometimes I will just do a passion project that I want to do for me. Um, just to try and keep my sort of spark and love for drawing alive. At the end of the day, when you turn a hobby into a business, you're always going to get that feeling of it being work rather than sort of fun. But because I do things for myself sometimes, I do keep my passion for drawing alive. But at the same time, I do always have like a an underlying plan for the things that I draw. I don't just do things completely at random because... I don't have the time to do things at random. Everything that I do needs to have a purpose to an extent. I do also like to keep my work looking quite consistent across my collection of wildlife. I use the same sort of drawing style. I try and work from the same pool of colours just so that it all works together and they all complement each other nicely. I'd like it to seem like if you saw my work on an Instagram feed, you'd instantly recognise it as something that I've done. I don't know if that's the case because there's a lot of wildlife artists out there and I know there's only so much you, you can do that's actually like different but yeah like I say I just try and keep my work quite consistent in style sort of feel vibe across all of my collection. Some of the animals that I'd love to draw next are a badger I've just got an urge that I want to draw a badger soon, a chicken, I'd like to do a horse, I just I get random urges sometimes to do certain subjects and I cannot stop until I've done it. But I'd also like to have a go at drawing some more botanical pieces in future as well, such as mushrooms, flowers, small little elements of nature. I keep saying that I want to do more botanicals, but it's just finding the time to do it. But the plan is I'd like to use these little small drawings to create like patterns that feature multiple drawings together um, but that's something that I'll do in the future that's probably a little bit of a way off just yet. I quite like drawing with the seasons as well so as it turns to autumn I like to do some more autumnal animals that you'd see more at this time of year in environments that have like little elements of autumn in them like I did the autumn hedgehog just stuff like that helps to keep you on track I am a big lover of the seasons and the fact that we get to experience these different elements of nature so I do like to incorporate that into my work whenever possible. So to cut a very long answer short, you've got to draw something that you feel passionate and inspired to draw and you've also got to think about what's going to be commercially popular amongst customers as well. Unless, of course, you're not doing this for business purposes and you're drawing purely for fun, then do whatever you feel like. There are no restrictions and you don't have to put yourself in a box and care too much about what other people will think of your art. Just create something for you. Okay, so our next question is, have you ever committed yourself to a drawing and after you're done, it's not what you envisioned? Okay, so to answer this very simply, yes, definitely. 
So I think, again, I'm going to talk about this from the perspective of originals more so than commissions, because when you're commissioned to create a piece of artwork, you're bringing your client's vision to life, working with your client to create something for them. So obviously you're going to have your own input and suggestions and creative vision, but ultimately you're working within the confines of the reference that you're given. So with originals, you've got a lot more freedom and it's about bringing your own vision to life. So that's what I'm going to talk more about in this answer. So first off, I think that every single artist on this planet has probably started something that they thought would be their next masterpiece and sometimes you'll get this really good feeling in your pit of your stomach like this is going to be really good, you know that it's going to be something special, then you start it and things don't go to plan and perhaps the execution doesn't quite live up to this like grand idea and plan that you had in your mind. More often than not, if I'm not happy with a drawing, I can usually tell in the very early stages whether it's worth carrying on with or not. I don't often get to the end of a drawing and think, mm, actually, I don't really like this. Usually I can tell before I've got to that stage. But at this point, I've lost count of the amount of times I've started something and then scrunched it up and thrown it in the bin because I know that it's not going to go anywhere and whether that's because I've chosen a reference that isn't quite right or I've used the wrong colours or sometimes I can do something way too big and it didn't need to be that big or I could do it too small and I can't get enough detail in. There's a lot of different factors that go into a drawing and while I'm all about pushing through the ugly stages and just persevering, sometimes I feel like if you're too far gone, you should just start again instead of wasting time. However, by the same token, sometimes you can do like a complete 180 on a drawing. You can start something, think that it's going really badly and then towards the end, it actually comes together in front of your eyes and you're like, wow, I'm so glad that I carried on with this. The Christmas Robin drawing that I did is a good example of this. It was going really well until I started doing the holly at the bottom and I completely overworked the greens. I used the wrong greens together. They looked really bad, really poorly blended and I just had this idea of this really like soft, nice like holly and it just didn't look like that at all. So I had to completely erase everything that I'd done on the holly and start again on top of like the already like damaged paper. I used different greens and I tried everything that I could to fix it and thankfully somehow I managed to salvage it and because I'd added that many layers of coloured pencil I pretty much hit like the limit of what I could add so I used a little bit of white acrylic paint on top to add a bit of like frost onto the leaves and try and like finish it off nicely. Um, I'll be honest I didn't like the acrylic paint for adding snow <laughs> and frost instead I use the museum aquarelle white now because it looks so much more natural but yes it didn't look anything like I had in mind and for a long time I really didn't like that drawing but I'd spent so much time on it and it was nearing Christmas and I had no Christmas card designs and I really just wanted to bring out a Christmas card design that year so I scanned it in anyway and for some reason when I scanned it in it's almost like it was like a completely different drawing. I just fell in love with it and you couldn't tell that there were mistakes in the holly anymore. Don't forget too that there are things that you can do post-production. You know, like once you've scanned it in, there are things you can do digitally to improve your drawing. While I wasn't happy with the texture of the drawing itself, once you've scanned something in, that's a flat image now and you can't see any texture on it, so it doesn't matter anymore. You can tweak the colours, you know, you can crop it. There's all sorts of different things that you can do. And in the end, once I'd scanned it in and edited it, I really, really liked it and I could see it as a composition, as a whole piece, rather than focusing in on that little bit at the bottom where the holly was. And I'm so glad that I persevered and I went ahead and made Christmas cards anyway because it's now one of my best-selling Christmas card designs and I'll be continuing to bring this out every single year and when I look at it now I just 
completely see past all of the mistakes and I thought I'd ruined it and really I was just in my own head about it. It's really funny how things work out because more often than not the artwork that I create that I'm really really proud of doesn't always do the best commercially like once I put it on products it might not be a great seller but the artwork that I create that I feel wasn't my best work and that I could do better and I wish that I could have restarted it and I don't even know if it's worth sharing it more often than not that's the the sort of stuff that sells really well and is really popular amongst my customers and my audience on social media and if I hadn't have put that out there I'd never have known that so while it's important that you like your own work sometimes you just need to let go of your own opinions and just consider that other people's opinions are just as important and they might have different likes and different um, interests to you and just because you don't like something doesn't mean that other people aren't going to like it. And there's no bigger critic than yourself. You're obviously going to look at your work from a really critical perspective of, oh, I didn't blend that very well. I didn't add enough detail there. But the average person isn't going to be scrutinising every single little detail like you are. So try and just take a step back and stop getting in your head so much. And that is something that I need to take my own advice for as well. Okay, so our next question is, what is the hardest commission you have ever done? So off the top of my head, I can't think of like any one specific commission that was the hardest, but I can think of a certain type of commission that I've struggled with the most over the years. And that is commissions where I've accepted a really, really low quality reference photo. So back in the early days when I first started, I didn't really have the privilege or confidence to pick and choose which commissions I wanted to do. So that meant I pretty much accepted every commission that came my way and I didn't really try and dig deeper for better reference photos. So I pretty much just took whatever I was given, which is fine. It's all about building experience. And to be honest, it's those challenges that help to shape the artist that you are today but it doesn't take away from the fact that it was extremely difficult and it probably did knock my confidence in a way because I just felt like I wasn't good enough and you know why is it such a struggle to create these commissions why I felt like I was quite good at drawing but I'm really struggling with this but I have realized over the years that the reference photo is crucial to the finished outcome so if you're given a reference that's like perhaps a scan of an old photo taken on a polaroid camera and it's really dark the pet is about two meters away from the camera and the colors don't look true to life it's going to be incredibly difficult to create a really high quality detailed commission I think if you're going to work from a photo that isn't giving you all of the information straight away, you're obviously going to have to come up with that information yourself. So if you're not an experienced artist, which I wasn't to begin with when I was accepting all these like low quality references, you've got to make these things up. And if you've not practiced using certain colours or textures before and you're having to create that for yourself now it's going to be incredibly difficult to try and make that up for yourself. To begin with I didn't really understand how lighting worked and how a pet could look darker in a certain lighting than another and you've got to lighten it yourself in order to sort of counteract that darkness and I pretty much just drew things as they were and it, sometimes people wouldn't be happy with how it turned out because it didn't quite have the real colours that the pet was and yeah it was just a lot more stress than it was worth sometimes doing these low quality references and over the years I've learned to say no if I feel like I'm not going to be able to deliver something that I'm proud of and that the customer will be really happy with because at the end of the day we've not seen the pets in real life we only have this really small low quality reference to go from I have a lot of respect for artists that can use something that small and create an absolute masterpiece because I know that there are artists out there that can do that and it's an incredible skill to have but it is something that comes with experience and with practice it's something that I've been able to you know do better with over time 
I do sometimes accept low quality references now, but if it's something that I'm confident in that I've drawn a lot of times previously and that I know how like the the structure and the texture and the colours work, I feel a bit more comfortable accepting something like that. But you do have to learn your limits and learn when to say no. I think some people think that because you're an artist, you should be able to just, you know, be given some information and be able to like create it from your own head. But I don't have that ability. I can't see things in my head. I have to see it in a photo or a few decent quality photos that I can like take little pieces from. I, I can edit it together on my photo software and then I have enough to go from. But if you're literally giving me a photo of a dog from distance that I can't even see the colours properly, I, I just, I can't, I can't do it. I can't create something from that. Unfortunately, I'm not a miracle worker and I can only do so much with what I'm given. I also find commissions where I'm asked to do a lot of changes and to manipulate the original photo quite challenging. You know, say for example, you've been asked to add a different colour in that wasn't in the original photo. You've been asked to add a bandana or, you know, just little changes like that. There's a paw missing and you need to create the paw yourself. They're quite challenging because it's not just a straightforward like copy the image that you're seeing you have to put some more creative input into it and there are things that you can do to help with this like you can go on google you can search for images of dogs in the same breed see if there are any that have been taken at a similar angle that you can sort of take little pieces from and add onto your drawing if it gets to a stage where i feel like the client wants to completely change the whole image you know change everything about it then i probably will just say no i'm sorry i don't think i'm the right artist to do this for you if it's like one or two things that need changing and the majority of the image is as it's meant to be, then I don't mind. But yeah, like I said, if they want pretty much everything changing, then I just, I think it's a little bit too much for me personally. This also leads nicely onto our next question, which is, are there things that you've decided not to do art-wise? And yes, definitely. When I first started out, I actually used to do human portraits for a few years and I was never the biggest fan I'll be honest like I enjoyed drawing celebrities here and there you know I did a drawing of Walter White from Breaking Bad and I loved that and I did one of Harry Potter and I used to have fun doing that but as soon as I started but as soon as I started doing portrait commissions of like real everyday people I just completely lost interest in drawing people this might sound really weird but there's just something about staring at someone's face like all day every day that I just found a little bit uncomfortable and I just didn't enjoy creating human faces I don't know I just feel like there's a lot more that could go wrong I just didn't enjoy it I'll be honest and I do get a lot of requests now for doing human portraits like someone will ask if I'll draw the dog but draw the wife in it as well or draw the dog with the kid and I just I have to be really honest and just say I'm really sorry it's not it's not my forte it's not what I'm best at I like to stick with animals and wildlife because when you start your own business you do it because you want to do something for yourself and if there's anything that you don't enjoy doing there's nobody that's going to force you to do it you don't have to do it so yes it would probably open up the doors to a lot more potential clients but it's not all about that is it it's about being happy in what you're doing. Another thing that I don't currently do art-wise is frame my commissions or originals, anything like that. I have done it in the past where I've had a request from my client to frame the artwork and I've made exceptions but it just gives me the fear sending heavy glass frames in the post you know what some couriers are like with looking after parcels and it, it's not every courier but sometimes you might get the odd one that doesn't look after it and the glass will smash and then it's more effort than it's worth than sending that back to me to get it redone to then resend it the amount of money that you can lose out with th things like that it's just it's just not worth it for me at the moment if I had a local commission where they asked me to frame it and I was going to drop it off myself absolutely I wouldn't even think twice about it um but yeah it's just I don't know it gives me the fear maybe one day if I find some like 
ready-made off-the-shelf frames that don't cost as much as the bespoke ones I would consider doing frames but yeah at the minute it's just not worth it for me especially sending commissions like this one is going to Japan I've had commissions to the US the thought of not only getting the portrait there safely as it is in a mount but also in a frame where it could smash and I don't need that stress in my life <laughs> and also people are very particular on frames and there's just so much choice and sometimes you can give people too much choice and if I went to the framers and sent every possible frame that you could get it'd just take a lifetime to eventually get to the decision and yeah it's, there's just too many different factors involved with framing it's just not something that I feel confident in at this moment in time. Our final question is how do you keep a white background without accidentally getting colour on it and what do you do if that happens? So the easiest way I've found to prevent smudging onto the white background of the paper is to start from the opposite side to which is your dominant hand. So I'm right handed and I always start on the left side of the portrait and work sort of across and down in order to prevent smudging as much as possible. If you're left handed obviously start on the right side of the drawing and work your way left and down and then that is just the easiest way to prevent smudging in the first place. I always use a piece of tracing paper or sometimes even just like A4 printer paper underneath my hand and if I notice that it's getting quite dirty underneath I swap it out to be honest every time I come back for a new drawing session I swap it out just to be safe because I like that feeling of like a fresh piece of paper every time I come back to it. I'm also very careful when I am drawing with the tracing paper under my hand on a piece of the drawing that I've already done not to move my hand around too much so I'll try and keep the paper as still as possible and you know don't go like rubbing it with your hand because that is going to cause smudges and also I tend to save the black areas till last if possible sometimes I'll add black before I've finished but if I know I'm going to be leaning my hand over that area I'll perhaps wait until later to put the black on because it is the most like pigmented smudgeable colour <laughs> so you want to be careful with black I also use a putty eraser that is really good for getting little bits of colour off the white area. So anytime you see the slightest bit of a smudge or a bit of colour that's like transferred to the background, just use your putty eraser and just dab it really softly and it just picks the colour up really well. If you're using just a standard eraser that you have to like really rub, that's when you can start to damage the paper. So yeah, you want to treat the paper really like well and not be too harsh on it so a putty eraser is the way to go. I've also made really stupid mistakes before where I've practically thrown my pencil at my paper and I've marked the white background and wanted to cry over it but you can just keep working at it with the putty eraser as much as possible. Sometimes I use my little Tombow Mono Zero eraser to pick out little sharper bits of pencil that have stuck into it you know like if there's like a dot or like a little line or something I'll just really work that into that tiny area so that I don't damage the paper around it too much and I have also used a craft knife to pick out little bits of pencil if there's like a bit that's really stuck in there but you have to be super careful with that but I know that you can get tape that you can stick around your drawing you can put like plain paper around the big white areas and stick the tape on I know that Hannah Lipsy does that so go and have a look at her Instagram if you are interested in that because I've never done it before but yeah it always looks really good afterwards when she takes it all off and it's like nice and clean on the background also this is different for different papers I know that pastel mat is incredibly difficult to erase mistakes on so be super super careful if you're using pastel matte but I use Archie's hot press watercolour paper which is quite like a hard paper so it is quite forgiving if you do get any smudges or little like mistakes on the white bit of the paper. Papers like Saunders Waterford hot pressed watercolour paper are a pain for this because it's like the pencil indents and almost like soaks into the paper if that even makes any sense so yeah I do not like that paper for that reason and for other reasons but yeah Saunders Waterford is 
hard work. This is also a reason why I personally wouldn't use the grid method for creating outlines because it's not a very clean method. Like you're going to get pencil on the background and you're going to have to erase that at some point. So you're already taking a little bit of a layer off that paper before you've even started on your colour. So yeah, I prefer to use the tracing paper method for creating outlines. I do have a video on that if you're interested. So yes that is going to be it for this video if i didn't answer your question in this one don't worry i've saved them all in a document for the next one and if you have any more questions to add in the comments down below just let me know and of course we will discuss that in a future video so i really hope that you have enjoyed this draw with me let me know what you think about this format hopefully it'll be a little bit more interesting to you and make sure to give it a like if you did enjoy it because it really really helps me out subscribe to see more videos like this and i shall see you in the next one so bye for now